So is this going to be weird for you? What do you mean? So you've been doing this with Surma for years, right? And um, you're friends, aren't you? Yeah, but you know, people leave all the time. It's perfectly normal. Don't really think about it. Oh, here we are. Ah. Welcome to the studio. Ooh. Uh, what's that? Oh, um, uh, this isn't mine. Um, this is something the crew use for because it, it helps them position for the lighting. It, it, it helps them with the uh, shadows. Sure. Um, I'm just going to move. Oh, don't touch him. So, sorry, sorry. Um, it's just a little bit fragile. I'll, 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 I'll deal with it. I'm, I've got him. It's OK. Shh. You're safe with me. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK. Don't worry. I've got you. So, hello, Ada. Hi, thank you for having me on your show. That, that is fine. It's great, because it's episodes I don't have to write. And <laughs> that's what this is going to be, right? Yeah, so I have a few things I'd like to cover about WebXR today. OK, excellent stuff. Um, so you're, um, you work on the working group for? Yes, so there are two groups for um, dealing with the um, standards for WebXR. There's the W3C Immersive Web Community Group and the W3C Immersive Web Working Group. They have basically the same name and do basically the same thing and work really close together. But the community group is open up to anyone. Um, and for the working group, you have to be a member of a company that's a member of the W3C. Cool. So like, usually when, when I do these episodes, I, I have some slides, I have some code on the screen, and that's as exciting as it gets. <laughs> You've brought a VR headset, and you've got your phone connected yeah. up to the screen, and all of this sort of stuff. My so various toys. Yeah. Me. So I'm going to feel totally inadequate in the, the rest of, of my episodes this series. But come on, come on then. Come on then. Show cool XR VR stuff. So yeah, WebXR. Um, we have a cool logo. The logo looks like the Dart logo. Oh, no. <laughs> I never thought about that. It's supposed to be like a W and an X, and it's like 3D. It's a different color. It's a different color. Okay. That's fine. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the idea of the WebXR device API, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'll probably just call it WebXR for short. What, what, does, the, what does the X stand for? Ah, oh, that's a good question. It doesn't really stand for anything in particular. Great. Perfect. Um, <laughs> does the R stand for anything? Reality. OK. So We've got reality. Because it covers like augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, all these kinds of like general kinds of immersive hardware, um, we just put the X in there to be like, it can be for any of those. It's a placeholder, I suppose. Yeah. The main hardware we're focused on at the moment is um, so virtual reality headsets and like the, like the Quest, like mm -hmm. I've got here. Um, augmented reality headsets, like the HoloLens, which I can't afford. <laughs> um, then we have um, virtual reality like in handsets. This is usually like inline mode in devices. So this is the only mode where you can embed it in like a web page. All the other modes run externally. And you also have like handheld augmented reality to kind of like the thing you do on Pokemon Go. But even though it still runs on the same display as the device itself, it's still treated as an external display. It just goes full screen, takes over the device, and you can't display like normal web content on top of it. So let's, let's talk about the, the <laughs> web focus of, of this yeah. then. How does WebXR work on the, on the web? That's actually a really good question. Um, so I have an example here. And you won't be able to see this, but I think the, the very clever folks behind the camera will be able to superimpose this on the thing. I'll make a series of noises as, as if I'm watching something amazing right now. And okay. it, will, it will just come together in the edit really well. That sounds like a really smart thing to do. <laughs> um, so here we have a normal website. Um, it has a running in the Oculus browser. It has a URL bar, tab bar, you know, normal browser stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so when you land, it does take you to a 2D web page, which is running a WebGL scene. You push the Enter VR button because WebXR requires a button press to start. 
because it's kind of similar to full screen in that respect. It's a it takes over the whole device, so you want the user to be aware that that has happened. Precisely. So it can't like, yeah, duplicate UI that you know, might be privacy sensitive, that kind of thing. Exactly. Okay. You don't you don't want the user to feel like um, they're on their secure banking website <laughs> when actually they're inside evil.com, which is spoofing the whole operating system. Looking and forward to the day I do my banking in VR. That's that's a terrifying <laughs> thought. You've um, got to catch the money as it flies around, else it's it's permanently gone. Um, but yeah, that's it works. You just you land on the site, you push a button, you're in VR. So it's um, if you're yeah, actually that stopped the recording. I'm gonna take it off. Um, so if you're um, what well, if you want to deliver a VR piece of VR or AR content, then your main options are to build a specialized app for every single piece of virtual reality and augmented reality hardware that's out there, where the user then has to go to the app store for your particular site, find it, download it, and click on your icon when there's Beat Saber right there next to it, <laughs> tempting them to play that instead. Yep. Um, <laughs> and the alternative is um, you send them a URL they open up their browser, they open up that URL, and then they share it to their headset, put the headset on, and then uh, push the Enter VR button, and they're straight in your scene directly. Can I see some code? Can you see some? Yes, you I can. I want to see know how code. it works. OK, so I'm going to just show you, um, I'm going to show you A-Frame, because A-Frame is pretty cool. OK. Um, WebXR, I mentioned it briefly before, it's specifically works with WebGL, um, which, as web things go, isn't great. Like, WebGL is very powerful, and it's good at one thing. It can draw triangles really fast. Um, yeah. Every time I've tried to learn WebGL, I go to one of the tutorials. The scroll bar becomes this size, yeah. and I scroll to the bottom, and it's, ta-da, a red triangle. And I'm like, right, yeah. I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, but, my, my main. Um, way of making this point is showing people the um, the code for drawing a cube in WebGL from in raw JavaScript, and it's it's impossible. Like it's three hundred lines, and people don't need to know it to that level of detail. So when working with WebGL, there's a wide variety of frameworks you can work with that simplify the process. Okay. So these are the main ones. Um, there's 3JS, which is probably the oldest and most well known. Yeah. It has an extremely active community and is it's the one that I like using the most. And then there's A-Frame, which I'm going to talk about more in a sec, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because it's it's a web component wrapper for 3JS. Ooh. So you write HTML, and then under the hood, it connects up all of the 3JS parts so you get um, VR and AR ready um, WebGL. Writing 3D scenes using markup. Yes. Now, I went to university <laughs> in 2003. I think you're about to mention VRML. I am. I did a module on VRML at university. And even then, it felt like it was out of date. But yeah. I loved it. I actually really enjoyed it. It's amazing how accessible being able to write it in HTML is. I am talking a little about A-Frame. Um, has a really like large community, like lots of people. It's so simple to get into. Lots of people have got into it, and so it's it's pretty active. And this is the full hello world for A-Frame. Like I think it's what like nine lines of code, including the HTML and body tags. Nice. Um, and it pretty much does what it says on the tin. It like, does have a very like a uh, SVG vibe, but obviously 3D. Yeah. Right? It's that there's similar kind of like uh, presentation attributes. Mm. And yeah. So like you have you include the script, and then you have the A dash scene, which is kind of like if we're gonna uh, take your metaphor further, it's basically like the SVG tag. Mm -hmm. Like your A frame tag is the A scene. Um, that includes like a camera, some lights, and other things. And then you start adding the other things yourself. So here we have a box that's um, a meter by a meter by a meter by default, and it's placed. Um, one meter to the left, half a meter up, so it's not in, in the ground, and minus three, three meters backwards. Forwards, yeah. Forwards, so it's it's, the, it's 
negative z is the direction you're looking. Right, I see. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is an interesting thing to mention. So normally in graphics, you don't care about units. Um, if something's like um, a 1,000 meters wide and a 1,000 meters way, a wet way, that's pretty indistinguishable from something that's like one unit to you and one unit big. Mm -hmm. Um, but here you are two meters tall. Yeah, precisely. Right, yes. OK, like I in, see. In WebXR, your users have a height. And so, and because there is this relationship, you need to ensure that everything makes sense. So the default unit for distance is meters. And the default axis, um, y is up, yep. x is across. Yep, like and a graph. Yep, and z is into the scene. Um, yep where negative z is into, and positive z is behind you. Right, got you. You define it for all these things. Um, so we have a box, a sphere, a cylinder, and a plane. Um, I'm not going to work out the color of the hexes <laughs> in my head. I guess I could. You so wrote this. You, you could have known this in advance. I could, yes. Um, OK, I'll work No, out don't the, do it. <laughs> the, the, the box is cyan. The sphere is red. The <laughs> cylinder is FC6. It's quite red. Um, yeah, that's like yellow. Yeah, it's cyan. Like uh, yellow, orangey. Yeah, like and pink, pink maybe? Yeah. Uh, and, and the plane is. This is great. Well, let's just do this the rest of the episode. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, in a gray sky. Yes. And so the sky is, is an inside out sphere. Um, right, because for the texture mapping, I guess. Yeah. So, um, 3D objects only have one side. So for example, the, the floor here is a plane. And what we've done, we've rotated it minus 90 degrees in the x-axis, which means it flops down. Right. But if we did it minus, if we did it plus 90 degrees, so it's the other way, it would be invisible because it only has one side. And if people have done work with 3D stuff in CSS, the equivalent would be back face visibility. Yeah, exactly. Where you toggle that thing. Right, OK. Um, and so in this case, the sky is a sphere that's, I think it's five kilometers big and inside out. Right. Um, and that's why you can see it. And so it sets a color for it. Nice. That's what it gives you. Um, and so it's, we were right with cyan then. Was, no, hang on. The cylinder is yellow. We were, yeah. OK, I was, yeah. I can't read hex is what we've learned. Uh, yeah. Fine. Yeah, it's, but nice thing is you can actually use HTML color names. Oh, cool. Um, because it, it just parses the color string as um, as a CSS color and gets you the actual color. So you could do lavender blush, brick red, um, hot pink. Nice. And kind of think of another cool color. Um, light golden rod or light something. Light golden rod, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you can use CSS color names too, um, which is what I do most of the time, because I'm lazy and I've spent way too long building HTML web pages before CSS was a thing. I suppose in DevTools, you could play with those values afterwards to get a. You can, yes. You can change the values with DevTools, and it will update when you change the values in the HTML. Very good. And that's the thing that would be much harder to do with like 3JS. Yes. You, you don't get that, yeah, that instant response from playing around with DevTools. Yeah, it's really nice. And it even has a built in inspector. So if you press Control Alt I, in an A-frame scene. It opens up an inspector, and you can move things around, and then you can copy the values into your own code. Nice. Um, which is like a v makes working with it very quick. So the default, like the, the div for A-frame <laughs> um, is the A entity. OK. And so the way it works is that you attach components to A entities to make it do stuff. So to make a pink box, we would set the geometry to box and the material to hot pink. So it has its own like, extensions to CSS there, is what we're seeing there. Like, it, it's CSS-like syntax, primitive box. Yes. Right, OK. Um, yeah, so for the, so components tend to, um, the most simplest components, you can, will just have a, like, my component is value. But the moment you start to get more complicated than that. You start using this CSS-like syntax. So you, so for example, for primitive box also has a width, height, and depth property. You could also set to make it a more oblong shape. Okay. Um, but you can um, 
define entities to be a, um, you can define your own entities which map the components. So for example, the a-box component has the geometry already set to be box. So th this is like a shortcut. Yeah. This you could do entirely as an entity with all of the properties. Yeah. So it's a, I guess it's a bit like you know you could create a div, you can give it a roll of button, you can add the stuff, or just use a button, and this is exactly. the sort of mapping. Right. Yes. I see. Okay. And the nice thing is that you can define your own ones of these. So if there's something you you use a lot with many like tens of components, so a really complex thing, you could just predefine it, and then you can just use like my dash component all over the place and um, it'll just work. Right. It's yeah, it's really nice. So if you've used web components before, like it's um, it's a really nice way of doing it. And um, if you poke through the source code of A-Frame, or you can see that it's pretty much um, a very friendly API, um, and it gives you hooks directly into 3JS underneath. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was kind of my high-level overview of A-Frame. Excellent stuff, and that's so. We'll put links to all of that in the in the description, yes. so people can like, yeah, because it's an open source thing. It's free to use, mm. and yeah. So if people want to get get started with WebXR stuff, that's a this is a nice easy way of doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Um, I also want to show you. Um, so I showed you some virtual reality earlier. I just want to show you some augmented reality because it kind of shows off some of the more advanced features um, of what WebXR can do. All right. Um, So here we have a. Um, That's not augmented reality. No, this is just um, this is like the magic window kind of thing. Okay. Um, so I push the augmented reality button, and it's gone full screen. Um, but notice how there it are there are still HTML elements over the top. So this is. Oh yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. So um, normally um, WebXR is. WebGL only. But we do have an API that lets you define a single element to be placed full screen over your AR scene, and it works on handsets. Um, unfortunately, trying to describe what going full screen with a HTML element means in, a, in an augmented reality headset is a very difficult concept. Yes, that um, would make sense, right? Where, where is the top yeah. left, bottom, right stuff, right? OK. Um, but here, it works really well. Yeah. Um, and then the other feature we've got here, so see where it's like trying to place this reticle on the floor? Yeah. So this is um, trying to work out the, the 3D position of, um, well, the 3D position and rotation. So I can place stuff on walls as well, or the ceiling if I wanted. Um, and it lets me place objects in 3D. So I'm going to try placing Excellent. somewhere. Let's put it, move this bowl. Yeah. And then we'll pop it on the table. Um, so boom. Actually, that's not very good, because then the shadows like don't fit very well. Let's but it's, it seems like it's it pick, picked up the lighting of the scene. Yeah, so that's quite an interesting one. So it does work out the direction, intensity, and color of the lighting. Is that is that the library doing that, or is that built into WebXR? That's built into WebXR. That's really cool. Um, it's also showing that, although the set looks very clean at this angle, it's a mess the other way. <laughs> yes. Um, so although it doesn't apply it to your 3D models, it basically tells you all the information you need that you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And in this case, A-Frame has it built in to take that information and apply it to the models. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, gives it a shadow, and it works really well. So yeah, one cool thing, which is very subtle and hard to notice, is that it doesn't just um, let you know where um, where you place the object when you tapped on the screen, mm -hmm. it also continues tracking that position as what's known as an anchor, so an anchor in 3D space. And so it keeps telling you where that anchor is. So when I pan around and look over here, say look at you for a bit, like look around and come back, my object stays where it is because it's maintained the tracking of that object. Nice. So yeah, it, it, it's got a point in 3D space where, where that stuff is, and it re yeah. remembers it. And nice. so, because over time, um, the shape of the scene in the device's head, or well, it doesn't have a head, in its like memory will will evolve because it'll, it'll initially make some assumptions, like it'll just assume it's in like a, a flat environment and the floor is this far away. Um, 
but then it might realize there's a table there or there's another surface um, or maybe the room is bigger than it thought it was. Mm -hmm. And so what it does, instead of letting your objects drift as they, um, as they move further or closer to the origin, um, as the size of the environment changes, instead it works out where you intended to place the object and ensure that that anchor remains in that place even as the rest of the scene adjusts. Oh, nice. So if, okay. you, if you placed multiple anchors, say one on a table, one on a chair and one on the floor, um, and t 20 minutes later, they should, as long as we're using the, um, the anchors part of the WebXR API, they should still be in the same place. Um, as long provided you haven't done something weird, like move the table or start moving furniture around, then it kind right, of yeah, ruins the tracking. Oh, better off then. Yeah, yeah that's um, fair. That is fair. So it, yeah, it gives you a very stable augmented reality experience. So I've had my phone pointed at this thing for the whole time. So you shouldn't have seen it drift around the floor or anything. Like it should look pretty, it's pretty convincing. to the environment. Yeah. And so all that together works well to give you a really decent 3D experience in the web for not like a ton of work on the developer's part. And so using A-Frame, you can do this uh, like for yeah. AR as well as doing it for VR? In theory, um, like it, it's, it takes a bit of thought from the developer's part. But you can make something that works with augmented reality and virtual reality together. Um, so kind of like how you build a website with progressive enhancement and responsive design in mind. So progressive enhancement for when certain features are available, you use them to give a better experience. And responsive design, you design your scene so that it can like change its shape accordingly to the size of the display you're on. You're not having to build it entirely twice. It's just a little bit in the middle to, to deal with the differences of, of the Precisely. environment or device. Yeah. So that if you view it in virtual reality, you can see the 3D environment around you. If you load in, if you open augmented reality, then it hides the environment. So, and so the sky the element that you had before, does that automatically hide on? It doesn't automatically hide, but you could. There is a component called hide in hide on enter AR. You put it on that element. So when you start, the sky gets hidden. Um, right. Yeah, and so it is. It is possible to build for this, and then. You add support for controllers so that if the user is using a device with controllers, like an AR or VR, VR headset, it uses those. You add support for hand tracking. And so if you're on a device that supports hand tracking, it uses those. Um, Excellent. Yeah, it's um, so it takes a bit of thought, but it's kind of amazing what you can build with the web. And if you build something like that, you can reach like the widest possible audience of people with immersive hardware. You're not just focusing on one particular like, piece of hardware. You're able to support devices that haven't even come out yet. Exactly. As long yeah. as they have a web browser, right? Precisely, which I really, I really hope that we continue to have this, this, um, this thing where as more immersive web devices come out, they have a web browser. Like, there's even a, a new device coming out soon um, which you will even have a have a new um, a new browser designed for XR. So the new Wolvic brow browser was forked from Mozilla Reality Mozilla Reality by Egalia uh, in order to carry on supporting VR on immersive headsets. Mm. And so it's really great to see that as new hardware comes out, they really view the web as a as a high priority. Excellent. Yeah. Seems like a cup one. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Uh... Don't you dare. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs>